Hey everybody, welcome to the Garage Workshop. Today we're going to be doing a table saw review on the Evolution Fury. This is the PTS255. Um, just going to give an honest opinion on exactly what I think about it. I've had it for about three months now. I've used it pretty much every time I've been able to go in the workshop for all the built ins that you've seen in previous videos. Well, let's get put it through its paces. So this is my table saw, I've had this for about three months like I said before um, and the reason I bought this particular one is when I was looking for all the various table saws in the market was I knew I was going to be making a lot of products using sheet goods, particularly AP4s because it saves money than buying smaller sheets from your box stores like B&Q, your Wix, you can buy them in smaller sheets, you can even get them to cut them down but there's going to be at times where I'm not going to want to stand in a queue to get sheets cut down, I haven't got the time. And then it might not be available during lockdown when I haven't had various uh, of these departments open for me to do so. A lot of the times I've had to cut these down myself. So I wanted a saw that had as large a rip capacity as possible. First one I bought said it had 600 and it, it had like 300 when you actually come down to it. A bit of a, a nightmare, a problem with it, which you can see on the table saw so takedown video from previous. Uh, so I've got this one. Uh, tried it out, but I haven't done a review straight away. I thought I'd use it for three months, see how it goes, cut all manner of things on it, and then go from there. So I think this is advertised as about a 650mm rip capacity. Um, however, that I believe can vary from sort to sort on manufacturing, just because it's probably because of its price point. Um, if it was a very high end product, you're probably going to get the exact same rip capacity on every single saw. This varies from what I've heard from slightly over 650 to slightly less. I get this as slightly less, um, only a smidgen, so 635, which is more than enough for what I need. And the reason I wanted that is on an 8x4 sheet, which is 122 wide, I can cut that down exactly in half if I needed to. Um, and be using 8x4 sheets, I can cut the maximum amount of a width off and save on the amount of waste that I'm going to use. Not like a panel saw that you'd find like when they cut them down in VQ, it's on that huge machine and they can just pretty much cut anything. But I wanted the maximum amount of capacity possible for this. So I'll quickly just show you how the mechanism. So this is it here in its, in its full capacity. It's got a little slider which is just underneath here that allows this bench or extension table to move back and forward. So that will slide all the way back here right to the very end. And you've got little marking gauges on here that obviously are going to be from zero all the way to its max capacity without the extension table on. And obviously the ones on the left hand side for your mitre gauge. It's also got a series of numbers that are below that for the actual fence itself to add on. It does come with an extension on this fence that you can add to it. And by pushing this all the way down so that you can feel the resistance, that's the actual, actual stopping point of it. That just locks into place to give you the maximum amount of rip. This, this fence then allows you to slide it all the way up to the blade guard itself and all the way down to the full capacity on there, giving me the 635mm rip that I need. Uh, that is a locks in place just on here. Uh, and that goes the full distance as well. One of the most important things I realised from the first machine that I bought is that it has a full length fence. The uh, reason for that is the previous table saw that I bought only had a, a half size fence, so the fence only goes up to this point. So when you're running sheet goods through, as you've got past that point, unless you're holding it down properly and you're not using the right tools, the sheet wants to turn away or turn in towards the guard because there is nothing there anymore supporting that line. So you end up obviously getting a naff cut or it'll end up burning the actual wood and you can hear it trying to struggle as it gets through. And the only problem you'll come across when using a table saw, particularly a job site one like this or a portable saw, rather than the full length cabinet saws that you might have seen on various videos like the saw stock ones which are like unbelievable but cost a gazillion bounce, is the logistics of actually cutting an 8x4 sheet. So although this capacity, I can cut an 8x4 sheet up on this, no problem at all. It is very difficult to do in a small workshop when you haven't got an outfeed table. An outfeed table is basically just 
um, worktops that you've got in front at the back and at the sides to actually support the wood. If you try and imagine this is something like three feet by three and a half feet wide, trying to put an eight foot sheet of wood in it that's particularly heavy, especially MDF, it's ridiculously heavy. To try and cut that down when you're holding it to one piece, you're having to get somebody to give you a hand. The whole point of being able to do the woodwork and as you're doing it on your own generally, so it's quite difficult to do. What I tend to find is I'll have to plan ahead in the projects that I'm making. So I get all my timber from a local timber yard who are great and they'll cut it down to pretty much any spec. So I don't need this. However, there are times I'm going to have to use this to get a, a cleaner edge. Um, guys in the timber yard and places like B&Q if you want to use, they'll cut it down for you. But they're using blades that are very dull, get a rough finish. It's not 100% perfect. It's just purely for getting it down into a manageable size. This will obviously cut it down a lot more accurately because I'm taking a bit more care with it. So there we'll cut them down to a size that's manageable for me to then, so I can cut that down to a four or five foot sheet, depending on what I'm building. So like a wardrobe, I can get them to cut the, the length of the panel down, the width of the panel down, and I will finish it off on the table. So knowing that I've got a certain amount of capacity, that will help. Okay, so next up, just a little bit more about the fence at the side, which is obviously mega, mega important to make sure that these straights are cut uh, accurately and as straight as humanly possible. Um, so this is the actual fence just here. So as I mentioned before, it's a full length fence. And the way to clip this on, this just actually holds on the top of the back side here. And you just line it up with the groove that's preset into there. The lever locks it down. And there is absolutely no play in that whatsoever. What I found with the previous table saw, even though it wasn't a full length one, it was still only half. If I pulled it at the back end here, it moved back and forward. So even when it was locked down, it would actually shift. So when you're sliding the wood through, it would actually push the fence out of the way, creating a, a terrible cut. It can never be accurate. Um, this obviously slides on its own runner and it's got some measurements across here for the left and right hand side. This can move over to the left if you agree, if you prefer to use it on the left hand side. But your max rip capacity is always going to be to the right. If you put this over to the left hand side, I think your max capacity is something like 300 mils for much smaller cuts. So I tend to use the, the left hand side is more for the micro gauge. For reading the numbers as well, it's got a little magnifier for you to see the numbers a little bit easier. Which is good when it starts getting clattered up a dust every now and then as you're, as you're using it. Okay, next we've got the blade guide itself and we'll talk a little bit about the actual blade seeing as they're all in the same place. Um, before I carry on with the video, I will show you that I have unplugged it since I'm going to be messing around with the blade and the blade guide here. If you are going to be doing any sort of work with the blade guide itself and the blade, always make sure that you've got it unplugged. Ideally, switch it off at the wall obviously, but if you just unplug it, it's easiest for it to do it. So, the blade guard sits itself on a riving knife, so it's got a riving knife built in at the back, which is basically support for the wood. So as you push the wood through, a riving knife is a solid block of steel or whatever the material might be that fixes to the arbor or the back of the blade itself that it spins on. So as the wood comes through and it's the same thickness as the blade, the wood itself doesn't pinch in. Um, it can obviously separate, but it doesn't pinch in, which is going to cause uh, it to grab hold and it can spit them back out. Um, the one downside I've found with it is initially when I first had it, um, the riving knife seemed to be wobbling around a lot and it used to catch as I was running things through and I thought it was the riving knife that was actually too thick. It turned out that it was actually the blade guard itself. The blade guard is attached to the riving knife. Just with a little screw here and, and the hinge and it's on a little spring load so you can see that it comes off really easily. The downside of it is because it's fully fixed, if this was in a, a lower position, no matter what size wood I'm cutting, and I've raised the blade to accommodate for the thickness of wood that I'm cutting, when you run it through, the blade gets stuck on the back of this blade guard here. So sometimes, particularly when you're pushing sheet material through, you're pushing it through and it'll, as it reaches this back point, It'll be difficult to move. You've got it pushed against a blade guard. You're forcing it down. So you're putting all three points of contact in the right place. You're pushing it against the blade guard, pushing it down against the table, and you're pushing it through using the right tools. It still sticks. It's not that it's popping up or anything like that. It's just that it catches on the bottom here. And because you can't, doesn't matter if you 
you could put the table so the blade goes a little bit higher than you need so the blade guard is out of the way because that will rise along with the blade and the riving knife you're then making your blade dull faster because you're having to put it higher up to accommodate a small piece. So I could put a 20 mil piece of wood on here, but I'll have to set the blade height to be something like 30 or 40 mil, so that it doesn't catch on the back here. It's just the angle that it sits at. If this was on some sort of pivot that allowed the wood to go through, and it moved up on the back section with the wood, that would be problem solved. And it would just be a little tiny spring that they've got in here. It would just be facing the other way to allow it to happen. So that would be a lot easier. So that it is a bit of a faff when you're trying to push something through and it, and it catches and you obviously don't want to force it too much because you're pushing because if you get your fingers caught in that that's game over uh, you'll be on a nice trip to the hospital for that uh, so just one flaw regarding that uh, the other one regarding the blade itself when you get this it'll be a, a multi-purpose blade uh, from Evolution Fury um, it does about 2500 RPM uh, this particular saw so it doesn't spin as fast as some other saws uh, and that's because because of the multi-tooth. Um, it allows you to cut through sort of thin sheet material like um, all, m most woods, um, plastics, um, and some sheet metal that will go through. So good if you're doing sort of perspex, banister rails, things like that. It's handy to have. I only use it for wood cutting. Um, so I've never actually used the multi-blade itself apart from when I first got it. But what I found is because it, it doesn't spin as high as others, it tends to burn when you're putting wood through. So I've gone and got myself a different blade, uh, which I'll put the link in the description. It's from Saxton on eBay. They do a blade designed specifically for Evolution. So they obviously know that there's an issue that Evolution have here. Um, this is an 80 tooth blade. So it gives you a really, really fine cut for rip cuts. Really good for cross cuts as well, which is when you're putting the wood across here using your mitre guard. Um, leave very, very little splinter in. Um, but you can get staying, staying with the blade here the the last negative thing so the three negative things overall this is the final one um not that it's negative 99 percent of the time and it's actually changing of the blade so the actual insert itself the spanners that you get with it actually open this blade guard it's only a couple of inches wide and you can see that my hands here are quite large uh, so I've enormous hands compared to some people that I found it really difficult to change the actual blade itself. The spanners that it come with are always useless on tools I've found and it's better to just have your own socket set. So make sure you get a decent socket set to change these blades over. Uh, ideally a, not a, an expensive socket set but one that is um, can lay a little bit flatter so it's, you, you can buy socket sets that enable to work in really tight spaces so they have much thinner um, adapters that you can put on there that allow for changing those nuts so I use the hex bolt system on that to change these over but I find that I've got to sort of put my finger in down at an angle you basically you, you pull this all the way up but it can only go up so far this whole thing doesn't come up past the table height so you've still got to put your hands into the machine so again make sure you've unplugged it and switched it off but I just find it really difficult to get your hands in. Any more hands bigger than mine really aren't going to get in there. The amount of times I've scraped my knuckles on the actual blade, trying to change the blade to begin with, and then changing the riving knife. This can actually move up and down. Um, I've kept it in one position now. You're supposed to put it in different positions, depending on whether you're doing a through cut or whether you're doing um, a standard sort of rip cut. A through cut is when you're cutting a channel in a piece of wood, like a groove, like a, a rebate or a dado. Um, or you're putting the groove in the back of a panel or something like that. You're supposed to change this for when you're doing a normal cut that just chops a piece of wood in half and in effect it's supposed to have a different height. Um, I can't see the benefits for and against that so I just have mine set at a height um, that's far enough away from natural blades so there's no catching of the blade on the riving knife. Um, but yeah just changing it is a really really awkward thing so please bear in mind if you have large hands this might not be the sort of video unless you're happy to go through a little bit of bruised knuckles and cut knuckles every time you change the blade okay so next up is the mitre gauge section of it i don't use it as much for the projects that i've used but there will be times obviously when it comes in handy i have used it a bunch of times um, so like any standard mitre gauge that comes with it on this particular table saw it sits on the left hand side and just moves back inside its own channel there is a tiny little bit of play so you're going to make sure that when you're putting a piece of wood in there that it's fixed down 
when this is screwed in not screwed into place if you're using this particular slider but you will find a little bit of movement so make sure that you sort of push against one side or push on the left hand side just to make sure that it runs along with its channel However, one little feature that it has as I found that when I first started using this is when you put this miter gauge all the way to the back there's only a certain amount of depth of wood that you can physically put in there so if I was putting a small sheet and cutting it down um, to put a miter on it I'll do whatever with it even just a straight cut it can only be sort of six inches long otherwise I'm already at the blade when I put it in and you want it to make sure that it's before the blade so you can then run it through just like that so there is a little catch at the bottom here so this allows you to screw this into place so that it's not going to move and there's a little release valve underneath here that allows to slide all the way back like so so you can put a much bigger piece onto this particular thing on the table itself slide it back and forward I've locked that into place at the minute you can that just slides back and forward as you can see making just a fine a neat little trick uh, to have if you're cutting a, a bigger piece that you need to put on a miter which you can put it like this uh, the miter gauge itself isn't particularly um, expensive for anything like that same material as the one on the main rip fence but that locks into place really well it's nice and sturdy I found this to be a little bit out um, again it could be limited to this machine but again it's got a series of dials on the bottom here you can set it to 0 45 a little bit further on this particular machine I found that the zero isn't perfectly zero it's something like half a degree out but when you're doing a picture frame and you need to put a miter on it when it's half a degree it's a massive difference it's going to end up all skewy um, so one thing to bear in mind if you're doing a lot of miter cuts it's really handy to have this that will go back and forward okay so moving on to the portability side of it so it's classed as a job site saw and it's a portable saw as you can see feet at the bottom and also wheels on it um, if you have a very small shop just like I've got um, I leave mine up most of the time because it's only me that works in here and it has a bit of a utility sort of area for washing and things but if you're taking this onto a job site or you need to store it away um, once it's built in place which can be a little bit fiddly if you put it in upside down just comes with a little catch on the bottom that allows you to fold that up and that can then be transported anywhere in, in your garage, your shed, whatever you need to do fairly chunky wheels so it's quite easy to move up and down staircases no more steps and if you need to put it back into place put your foot on that little pivot and that just folds it back up it's nice and solid and put in place it's got little nuts uh, wing nuts and adjustable feet on here so that if you've got a bit of uneven ground like I have you can adjust these so it's it so it's it's not rocking about as and when you're putting it there'd be nothing worse than not being able to get it adjustable putting that piece of wood through at one end and all of a sudden it jumps off either gonna again lose fingers or you're gonna trap something in the blade or just make a really bad cut at the end of it which is the most important thing yeah and our penultimate thing we've got here is dust extraction which is obviously important to a lot of people particularly me small workshop get dust absolutely everywhere off a lot of these tools where you can't have dust extraction circular saws my pot there's no pot on that allows for it electric planers jigsaws you can't get pots or anything of these you're going to put hoovers next to them and just try and get as much dust out of the air as humanly possible so the dust extraction on the machine itself is I would say abysmal if it's not plugged into a hoover section so if I were to use this now there would be dust absolutely everywhere all the underside this front part it gets absolutely caked in dust every single time you use it um, but if it's hooked up to a shop vac so I use a Henry Hoover um, put it in the part of the back um, it's absolutely perfect I would say 80% of the dust that it throws out is sucked up through that hoover to make sure you keep it well filtered and it can buy cyclone ones to add to it that would be even better saves than your hoover filter um, this particular machine itself uh, the only other dust that I've found that is an issue once it's even once it's plugged in with a hoover is the dust that you get from the cutting area you're always going to get fine dust in the air because the hoover is not going to, be able to suck absolutely everything out of there um, on some of the machines um, so the upgraded version to this um, 
also comes with a dust extraction for the guard itself. So the blade guard has got a little hose part on there that allows you to put a, a suction pipe onto the back of this. Works with the Hoover suction. So there's two little parts on the back of it that allow you to put a connector from the, the blade guard into the back. And then the one from the Hoover takes out all that dust. So all the dust, just like a little filter system, so it allows you to take the majority of the dust from there. Uh, as you can see, I don't have one on here since I got mine. I've been out of stock of these hoses for three months since I bought it from Evolution. Uh, they, have, they do a parts section on eBay, which I'll put a link on. Um, but again, they're out of stock, so you can't order them. I dare say if you went into more sort of places like B&Q Wix, you're going to find a hose that will connect it. Um, I'll put a link in the description below for some of the adapters that I use for my Hoover. For my Hoover because it's just sort of low, it doesn't fit in the back of this machine perfectly. Um, so I've just bought a, an adapter kit, I've got about six of them, that lets me put it into this back of this saw, into the chop saw as well. Um, just so you're not obviously getting, it makes a nice seal so you're not getting extra dust all over the place. Again, I'll leave those in the description. Okay, and last up we've got, uh, part of the review, is price. Price is obviously monster important for most people, it was for me. That's why I didn't go for a six, seven hundred pound machine, which you can do. I mean, in the long run, I would ideally like to get a cabinet saw, which is just totally fixed. Tons of round feet tables, so never have to worry about space, bigger cutting capacity uh, for cutting the length of sheets down, which would be more beneficial for me. But as it stands at the minute, um, not going to need that. Just new to woodworking like yourselves. No point spending thousands of pounds that you can do on these saws. So this one I got for 249 quid from Tool Station. Uh, when I first went to buy it after the debacle of the first table saw, this was actually on offer for £199. But unfortunately, Screwfix don't allow you to place a back order or a standing order for one for when it does come in, you can prepay for it. Um, it didn't come in before the, um, the sale finished, unfortunately, it went back up to £249. However, £249 for a saw of all these features compared to what I've seen is unbelievable value. I think the next saw that I was looking at was going to be a DeWalt job site saw. It doesn't have all the, the gubbins underneath this for making it portable, it's actually just the top section of it. That was about £500 and the only difference that I could see between them, probably from the build quality, build quality is probably a little bit better with it being DeWalt, um, more recognised brand, it's just the actual the system of the fence. The fence looked pretty much about the same, it was full length. Uh, but it had a rack and pinion system so as you could turn the dial to move these increments across uh, really smooth, made it a lot more accurate. I did test it out uh, but it was 500 quid. This was £249 for something I just lift a catch and move by hand. So it's a lot of money just to spend on a small inconvenience. Uh, not that I find it an inconvenience having to just lift that up and, and move it myself. Uh, but yeah, really, really great value. So all in all, it's a great machine. Hopefully it'll last me uh, a long time. I'm hoping to get quite a few years out of it if possible. Um, again, I'll leave all the links for anything that I've used on this uh, in the description below. I uh, hope you like the video. It's my first sort of review that I've ever done on a product. So if there's anything that you think I've improved upon, anything you didn't like, anything you think I've missed out, please leave a review in the comments. As usual, if you can like and subscribe, that would be great.